Yo, what's going on guys? Today we're doing the IDOR box, I-D-O-R. It's the next in the sequence for the junior pen testing. And like I said, this one's gonna be really fast because there's not really much hands-on examples that they're gonna show you, but I am gonna try and explain a lot of it. But this one is really cool. I actually got to um, do learn this initially, um, I think two years ago was when I got really deep dived into these. And it, I got to do it with a SANS expert, so it was really cool. I, it's crazy what you can do with this stuff if you learn it. Um, so IDOR, what is it first off? It stands for Insecure Direct Object Reference. So what it is, is an object in coding that um, is insecure, meaning they're not gonna validate what that object is, so therefore you can exploit it. And I'll explain what that means. So the first thing is it's just asking us what IDOR stands for is the first question. It's, pretty obvious you can just follow it right above indirect or insecure direct object reference all right so we can minimize that okay so an example of an IDOR what is an example so we're gonna show you here and if we view the site I haven't done this part yet so hopefully um, okay so it's saying check through the emails below to try and identify it in URL that looks like it could potentially be vulnerable. Okay, so this one here, see it has a URL, but there's nothing on it. There's no numbers, there's no identifiers, there's nothing. So we're gonna go to the next one, see. Okay, so this one says the online store.thm, but then it says order one, two, three, four invoice. So that's possible that we could do that. Um, let's see. This tells us that we have to try and find the one with the user. That is just a try hack me. Okay, so it looks like the order confirmation is the, really the only one. Okay, and you can see here, it just says the online store, then it says order, and then it says one, two, three, four. So what happens if we change that one, two, three, four? Is it gonna validate that we are still who we say we are? Because if we're user one, two, three, four, right? If this says user ID one, two, three, four, or whatever, is it gonna validate to us that we are that user still because we already logged in. We're already considered that user. Is it still going to check every single page we go to? That's what we're trying to find out. So this one here, it says one, two, three, four. And this is for an order that we did. But what if we change that to 1000 and hit enter? Well, would you look at that? Now we have a totally different order that's not ours. We shouldn't be able to see that. But it never validated that we're not that person. So you can see here, we got the flag for it. So we'll type that in, but that's what that's kind of what we're looking at is is these objects that are not being validated. So what that would what that would look like for you guys, or for an attack box, and there are some attack boxes on TryHackMe that have this vulnerability. But what that would look like is up here on my login screen, and and you can see I'm logged into TryHackMe, but it doesn't have this up here. That means it's encoded in the actual backend code so that you can still do it, you just gotta find it. But what you'll see in a lot of um, websites is you'll go up here and it'll say like username one, two, three, four, username stuffy, username whatever, John, whatever. You can change that and then it doesn't valid, if it doesn't have the validation check, it's not gonna look back and say, hey, is this actually him? Because you already authenticated past that point. So that's what you're looking for. Um, the realistically, a lot of websites have, have fixed this um, with validation checks and things. But keep in mind, this is still a very useful tool to learn because what you can do <clears throat> is find the encoded um, code in there and actually find out where it's calling back to and change it on the callback. Now, another thing that's shown you here is encoded IDs. So what this is is I've shown you guys CyberChef before. So if you go to CyberChef. This is really cool. So let's say I wanted it to say ID equals stuffy, right? Let's say I was logged in as John, but I want to change to stuffy's ID. Well, what we can do is we can actually change it to base 64 and you see this random numera or random numeric text. What that is, is that's just the base 64 encoded ID equals stuffy. And a lot of websites will use this base 64 encoding we can go ahead and go back to my box here. And it will do it, it'll do it that way so that it's hidden, so that you don't know what it's calling upon. 
But what it's actually looking for is it's going to take that user ID or the, you know, in our last instance, the order number, and it's gonna encode it. So it just looks like scribbles and gibberish to people. But if you can decode it and then change it and then re-encode it and send it to them, it's pretty simple and it works. It's really cool. I have a whole box on it. Um, I might do an in-depth scenario on it sometime, but I have a really cool box for it. Um, but it's just kind of explaining to us what that looks like and what it would be and showing us the process here. So it would just be, you know, your regular ID equals 100, whatever, and then it would be encoded, then sent to you and be in your, in your HTML format. And then as soon as you get it, you could decode it, change it to maybe 101 and put it back and you probably will get something. So it's asking us here, common type of uh, encoding used by websites, and that's base64, like we said. So boom, we got the correct answer there. So let's keep going. This box doesn't have a lot of examples, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time harping on it just because there's not really much point. I can't show you using this box. So this is one that you just have to get the information, information understand it, and then start deep diving yourself into it and how encoding works and stuff like that. Um, this one is very simple, hash IDs. If you guys have seen hashes before, um, I know we've covered them before on this channel. So if you don't know what a hash is, it's just basically they take an algorithm based on what you give it. So whether if it's just ID number one, two, three, it'll take an algorithm to that and it'll turn into a bunch of text just like this. And you guys can see it there. It's going to turn into that text. And that's the hash of one ID number one two three. Now, what you can do is you can go on to sites like this, like crackstation.net, and we'll go to it. And let's say we want to do ID equals one two three. I'm not a robot. Boom, crack hashes. Okay, so okay, I did it backwards. This will actually crack the hash. So let's say we wanted to take this hash, copy it, maybe. And then we'll go here and paste it and we'll do this. So this will actually give us the hash. And look, the result is one, two, three. So if you look if you're looking in your um, up here, sometimes on the URL bar, sometimes it's, it's encoded in the actual um, page source and the callback and stuff like that. If it's calling to another site to authenticate you, it'll be in that session. Um, either way, if you can decrypt these, find them change them to what you want and then send it off, sometimes it'll let you in because it doesn't validate that. It's just it's just looking at the information given to it and it's sending it on. All right, so it's asking us, what is a common algorithm for hashing IDs? That's MD5, that's pretty simple. All right, now it's talking, this one's talking about unpredictable ones. So this one is, is a little bit trickier. It's just saying if the ID can't be con detected using the above methods, meaning that you can't, simply go to CrackStation or whatever website you go to and it works. What you can do here is it's telling you, you can take create two accounts, okay? And then look at the IDs, the ID fields in the um, actual source code, see where it's sending the IDs, and then try and switch them. So what that means is, let's say you have a, this won't work on Facebook, I'll tell you right now, but let's say you go to facebook.com and you up here you see user ID equals one, two, three, when you're logged in, and then you log in with a different account, and it says user ID equals four five six, right? We'll try and swap them. Swap them. Try and be logged in as four five six and change your ID to one two three, and then hit enter. Go to it. If it works, then you know for a fact that's a vulnerability, and now you just have to guess the other people's user IDs. It's that simple. So here it says, what's the minimum number of accounts you need to create to check for these ID ID doors? Just two. Boom. Perfect. All right, now, where are they located? So again, I've told you they can be encoded up here in the URL. Um, that's not something you see as often anymore, but there is a lot of um, URL encoding. So that's something to keep in mind that you can decode that text if it's all scrambled and you can actually kind of get some information. So, all right, let's read about it. The vulnerable endpoint you're targeting may not always be something you see in the address bar. Like we just said, it could be content in your browser. Perfect, so it's saying it'll send it through via an Ajax request. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna find a reference JavaScript file and it's gonna do 
send it off somewhere else to do the actual authentication. So what it says here is sometimes endpoints can have unreferenced parameters that may have been used during development and got pushed to production. So this happens a lot when you see people that um, don't develop websites from the ground up. They use templates and stuff like that. So like it said here, for example, you may notice, I know you guys can't read this part, but it says you may notice a call to the user details displaying your user information, right? But through an attack known as parameter mining, which is looking for four parameters, you discover that a parameter is also called user underscore ID that you can use to display other users. So what that means is, and I'll try and scroll up here, it won't let me, but what I'll do is I'll just go on here and show you guys what the text is. So what it's saying is you could find something like this, and this is kind of obvious, right? But so if you see this user forward slash details and then user underscore ID equals one, two, three, if you see that, and like I said, it might be base 64 encoded and you decode it and see that, we'll try and just change that ID number to whatever and then send it back. See if you get anything. If you do, awesome. That means you're, you're in, you figured it out. All right, so we got through the, the bread and butter of what it is. Now let's see if we can actually kind of find some of these, right? And I haven't done this lab actually. So let's, hopefully it's a good one. If it'll open. Do, 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 do. All right, so it's gonna walk us through this. All right, so here's the website. Let's go to it. And these are some of my favorite attacks because they're so simplistic, but something that most people don't think about. And it's cool too to see how people's minds work. Whoever found these first, it's a neat idea to have found this, right? Okay, so we're at the Acme IT support again. They love this website. All right, so first you need to log in. So I have to actually create, I don't have an account, let's sign up. Username, john, john at mail.com. Password, password, one, two, three. Password, one, two, three. All right, don't save. All right, so we're logged in now, right? So now that we have an actual login account, it says here, your account section gives you the ability. Okay, so we gotta go to our account. Okay, and you can see it's showing us our email, so we're actually logged in as us, that's good. Uh, you notice the username and email fields pre-filled with your information, which we see. We'll start by investigating how this information gets filled if you open your browser develop tools. All right, so let's go to the browser develop tools. And we're gonna go do 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 do. And we're gonna to go to the network one. Either way, they're all there. We'll reload the page. All right, and what we're looking for is we're actually looking for a callback. So if you open your browser developer tool, select network tab, then refresh the page, you'll see a call to an endpoint. So let's look for the call with the endpoint. And I know you guys probably can't see that, it's very small. All right, so we're looking for a call to an endpoint that says API version one. So, well, there it is right there. I can tell just by looking at what it is. You see that it says customer ID, and you can see it says customer ID equals 15. Interesting. So it's actually calling back to the other site to get to verify the customer ID and pre-fill that information is what it's doing. It's taking your login information, sending it back and saying, okay, now give me the username password, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually change that. So what we can do is find that user ID where it's sending the information. Oh, well, it looks like the flag's right there. Or maybe that's the one for the other, uh, one of the other ones. That'd be interesting, huh? All right, so what we're gonna do, it says here, this page returns JSON format, your user ID. Yep, yep, we see that. Okay, so we're gonna go to the response and there's the ID right there. We want to change that to, I think it says there's two that we can change it to. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. You can try testing this ID parameter for an IDOR vulnerability by changing the ID to the user's ID. Okay, so we need user one. So it says we can change this to try selecting users with IDs one and three 
and then answer the questions below. Okay, so what we could do is we can actually change this if it'll let us here. Why is it not letting me edit this? All right. Let's see if we can edit it. Edit and resend. There we go. All right. I don't use Firefox on here very often. All right. So we want to do one, and then the other one is three. Okay. So we'll send it. Did it actually send is the question, because we may have to refresh the page, but... It didn't actually resend, I don't think. Let's see if it did. Okay, so we'll do one again. And what we can do is we can actually just take this and go here and hopefully get it. All right, and there we go. We have their information. So all we had to do is we didn't even have to actually do all the editing. We can just take that URL. And apparently Adam84 is this guy's name, which I'm sure the guy that created the box, he probably did that for himself, which is pretty cool. So Adam84, boom. And then it's asking us for three. And does anyone remember our what ours was? So ours was 15, I want to say. ID 15. So if we go here and change this ID back to 15, look at the information it's filling for us. So what it's doing is it's giving this information to fill to the actual web server, but we can use that, right? So we're, we found our own, we found one, now let's find three. John 911, that's interesting that I chose John because I was not actually, I actually have not tried this one and did not know that that was there. So we got fake email .thm. Boom, and that's it guys. That's how simple some of this can be. Um, it may sound complex, but it's not necessarily. It just, they make it look complex. They obfuscate it so that you can't see it very easily, but you can dive into this stuff and find those little things like user IDs and stuff. Now I will tell you, I would never do this on a real site because the second you start doing this, it's already a crime, okay? The reason I tell you that is because you're already trying to access something that you do not have access to, and that is a crime. So keep that in mind. This isn't something to test out. This is something you do in Try Hack Me Labs or Hack the Box or anything like that. You don't do this in a real scenario. It's not like OSINT where you can get away with it because it's technically public. That's not how this works. So keep that in mind, guys. If you guys like these videos, I'm going to keep trying to do the junior pin testing as much as I can. I have a little bit of spare time in the next week and week or two um, before I go for my next certs, and I really want to keep keep diving into these. They do a really good job of explaining it on TryHack Me. That's why I like it. But let me know what you guys think. Hit the like button, subscribe if you guys enjoy it, and hopefully this helped you guys out. Thanks.